This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. Dear God, we come before you tonight and we want to give you the praise and the honor and the glory because you're most worthy of it. And so, Lord God, in difficult times, you call for people to make a stand. Help us to make a stand. Help people to know that we are committed followers of yours, not just by the, by the words that we give, but by the way that we live. Help us to show people the love and the care and the consideration and the respect that we want for ourselves. Help people to know that we love them because Jesus first loved us. And so, Lord God, we just come before you tonight. We have offered you our, our prayers and our petitions at the start. And so, Lord God, we just pray that you will fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Come among us and give us a real sense of your presence so we will know the living God as he moves among this building, but also in our hearts. And then, Lord God, as we listen to what Karen has to share with us, we pray, Lord God, that that's only the start of the sermon. The real sermon begins when we go out and start to live it out. So help us to live it out wherever you take us this week, in our work, in our schools, in our businesses, in the shopping centers, or wherever you want us to go. And so, Lord God, help us to be ambassadors for you. Help us to be soldiers in the cause of Jesus and to be willing to make a stand. And being a soldier is not easy. There's training involved. There's discipline involved. There's order involved. And it's the exact same thing true for the Christian and the Christian life. Lord God, help us to be disciplined. Help us not to be found wanting when it comes to reading your word. When it comes to doing good, help us to do it, Lord God. And help people to know that because we consistently live a lifestyle which is holy and honorable before our God, and before our fellow man, that the praise and the honor and the glory belong to you. So Lord God, just come among us now and just help us and guide us as we make a stand because we all claim that we are indeed on the Lord's side. Amen. So um, tonight we're gonna to finish our series in Thessalonians, so we're in 2 Thessalonians, and tonight we're going to look at chapter 3, which is on page 1190, um, 1190 in the Pew Bibles, but I actually want to start in um, verse 16 of chapter 2, and then we'll go on to chapter 3, so starting at chapter 2, verse 16, it's page 1190 in the Pew Bibles, let's hear God's word. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honoured just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For you yourselves, Know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, labouring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we did not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If man will not work, we shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. And as for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. 
If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. One of the things that I really appreciate about the teaching here in Bloomfield is that passages aren't just plucked out of the air on a whim week by week, because I'm not sure I would have chosen this passage necessarily um, to speak about. Um, it's our pattern to go through a whole book together, and um, sometimes it takes us a while. I still remember when Felicity came back from South Africa, she was surprised that we were still in Second Chronicles, I think, where we had been whenever she had left some time before. But the benefit of that means that we go through something in its context with a particular people, with, in a particular location, with a particular set um, of themes. And it also means that um, when we come to things that are more tricky or more difficult, it's in the context of a broader understanding of what we know in the scripture, not just an isolated episode. And I think our series over the summer has tested us a little bit. Some of it has been difficult. Um, we've looked at suffering and persecution, We've looked at identifying false teachers. Um, we've looked at the return of Christ, what happens when we die. Um, all big things, people that think Christianity's fluff are wrong um, when we look at these letters. But all of that is set against a backdrop of Paul's deep love for this new church in Thessalonica and his desire to mentor and to disciple them. And so in the content of this final part of Paul's letter that we're going to look at um, this evening, the content shouldn't really come as a surprise to us because we've had little hints um, all the way through. So as we begin to look at this, let's just um, pause for a moment to pray. Holy God, as we come to open your word, give us ears to hear and eyes to see the things that you would wish to reveal to us by your spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I wonder if you've ever been in a situation, maybe in a workplace or in school, where you have received feedback. Um, maybe when you're in primary school, you got two stars and a wish. Two stars of things that you were kind of good at and a wish for something to you improve upon. Um, in work, it might be your appraisal or um, some sort of performance management done. Sometimes nowadays they don't even don't just look at what your line manager says about you, but they go and ask the people that you work with what they think about you and maybe even people in an external organization. So there was a previous workplace that I was in. There was a traffic light system that was employed where your colleagues got to identify something green that they wanted you to continue, something, um, something you should work on, amber, and um, something to stop. And in response to this, which hopefully will come up on the screen, one of my colleagues wrote on their feedback, tidy desk, tidy mind. <laughs> now, I could have found you anything on that desk that you wanted to look for, but maybe they had a point. And I think Paul would be quite, have quite a lot of affinity with this idea of, of feedback. And he doesn't want the Thessalonian church just to stay where it is, but he wants the church to grow and become more like Jesus. And so that's why he's given over so much of his time in his letters to the misunderstandings and misconceptions they have about their theology, about what they believe about God, about what it is to be a follower of Jesus, but also the good things that he's heard in Timothy's report that we read about in the first letter. So in this book, or in this, yeah, in this letter, he's already dealt with um, persecution and suffering, which Adam opened us to us a couple of weeks ago. Then last week, um, Pete talked us through um, the issues in chapter 2 um, relating to false teachers and division, what was going to happen at the second coming, whether it had already happened. And tonight, Paul identifies another problem. But it's good for us to remember that it's done against this backdrop of love and compassion for the church. I don't know how you felt when I was reading some of 
that out. It didn't, some of it felt quite um, strange to be, to be reading out in front of you all. So I want to go back and look at the first few verses of chapter one, which say, um, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. So it's good for us to remember that context as we um, look a bit more closely at chapter three. And we're going to look at three prayers and a warning. They're not all the same length. So when you find them going on with one, it's not the same for all the rest of them. Um, so let's look at the first prayer. And it's Paul's prayer for the progress of the gospel. So we've already had Paul's really powerful prayer for them at the end of chapter two. It's focused on encouragement, hope, comfort, and strength. And now he's asking the Thessalonians to pray for him, for him and his colleagues, Silas and Timothy, that as they do the work of the Lord, the message would spread rapidly, that it would be honored and that they would be protected. When we were in 1 Thessalonians chapter five, we saw Paul describe the Thessalonian church as his brothers and sisters. And he asks them then to pray for him. So although Paul is teaching, he's training, he's discipling this young church, he's very much part of the family. He's an older brother. And along with these believers, he just wants them to be as earnest in prayer for him as that he is for them. And here, his request isn't for physical strength, it's not for health, it's not for provision, but it's for the word of God to be spread rapidly and to be honoured. So the speed Paul's talking about here might be the athlete running the 100 metres, and we're used to that sort of analogy from some of Paul's other letters. If he's writing today, he might talk about the latest viral sensation on social media, maybe a photograph or a post that all of a sudden starts to rack up thousands of likes unexpectedly and reaches a much wider audience than was originally anticipated. Paul has really big ambitions for the gospel and we can see how that prayer continues to be answered as we hear of believers in many different countries around the world. But it's not just that the gospel would progress quickly but also that it would be heard and received appropriately that it would be honoured. It's not too difficult to think of examples where the good news of Jesus Christ is not honoured or it's disrespected. Maybe it's a political leader using um, the Bible for his or her own ends, celebrity taking a verse out of context, maybe somebody claiming to be a Christian leader. And such misuse of God's word should grieve us deeply. In our haste to see the gospel spread, we must always be sure that we remain true to its message. Frank reminded us this morning that there are many different types of Jesus that people believe in, but there's only one who calls us to repentance, to turn from our old life of sin and to gain new and everlasting life in Christ Jesus. And in order for the gospel to spread quickly and to be honored where it is heard, Paul asks for them also to pray that they would be delivered from evil and wicked people. For he says in verse 2, not everyone has faith. Reading through the book of Acts, you can see time and time again how Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy and the churches that they planted faced fierce op opposition, sometimes from the Jewish leaders, sometimes from the Roman rulers and often from other people. And maybe given what Paul had written about earlier in this letter, um, the people who were persecuting, causing trouble, or the man of lawlessness in chapter two. Maybe when he's talking about this, he has a specific group of people in mind. But what is clear is that where the gospel is preached, there will be opposition. And our first line of defense is prayer. Because as Paul reminds us at the beginning of verse three, and as we've just been singing, the Lord himself is faithful. Later this evening, we're going to come to the Lord's table to share communion together as a body of God's people. And as you reflect on your own spiritual journey, you'll remember people, places, and situations that God has used in your life to draw you closer to him. Paul asked for prayer, that the spread of the gospel would be progressed 
and that it would be honoured. I wonder is it too much to think that our being here tonight to gather around this table is a result of that prayer being answered time and time again over history. And that should be an encouragement for us to pray, including for our own ministry team here in Bloomfield, those that teach the word Sunday by Sunday. Pray that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honoured. So that's the first prayer. Then we move on to the second one, which is Paul's prayer for the progress of the Thessalonians' faith. He's not content that they simply remain as they are, but instead prays that they'll be strengthened and protected, that they would continue to be obedient and that their hearts would be directed into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Paul understands that not only is this young church facing challenges and hardships, but there are many more to come. It's unlikely that Paul's going to be able to go back and visit them to encourage them in person, but he can encourage them through his prayers. I wonder, do you sometimes have someone weighing heavily on your heart and you don't quite know what to pray for them? Well, often when we don't know when or what or how to pray, the best thing that we can do is turn to scripture. And we have a brilliant model here in verses three to five. Give thanks that the Lord is faithful. Pray that they will be strengthened and protected from the evil one. Pray that they would continue to do the things that they have learned. Maybe that was through Sunday school or kids zone or camps or church or friends or family. And pray that the Lord would direct their hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. And while we're thinking about prayer, and Ian's already mentioned it, here's a reminder about the week of prayer happening every evening this week and the walk on Saturday morning. This is something that we do every September, but it's not empty ritual. Paul's request that the Thessalonians would pray for the progress of the gospel reminds us that he didn't rely first and foremost on his own merit, on his skills, on his abilities, or even the people that he traveled around with. The gospel would only be spread and honored in Bloomfield or Belfast or Ireland or Japan or the rest of the world through prayer and reliance on God the Father, the Son and Holy Spirit. So please do come down this week to join us or the themes I think are all in the order of service. So if you can't make it down, take one of those themes each day and remember it in your prayers. So those are the first two prayers for the progress of the gospel and secondly then for the progress of the Thessalonians' faith. And before we come to the third one, let's look at the warning, which is in verses 6 to 15. I wonder, did you spot the problem as the passage was being read? Paul doesn't really hold back here, does he? Um, Verse 6, keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. We hear that some among you are idle, They are not busy, they are busy bodies. Paul's not really pulling any punches. So what was the problem that he had identified? Some of the believers were just going along for the ride. They weren't pulling their weight. They were more concerned with interfering with other people in their work than they were concerned about undertaking their own. They were idle and they were lazy. They weren't looking out for the needs of others but simply concerned about their own. And there's something different about this group of people compared to those that Paul has identified in the first couple of chapters. The persecutors, the false teachers were outside the church, but this time Paul is talking about people inside the fellowship. This challenge exists within the family of believers. In Thessalonica in the first century AD, AD, and maybe in Belfast in the 21st century. If Paul was giving feedback, this would definitely be a red light. If some of them are lazy, he doesn't just accept that some of them are lazy and that's just how it is. He's not going to leave them there. No, he takes time to address the issue and to call it out. In verse 12, it says, Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus to settle down and earn the bread they eat. Kind of makes you think that maybe Paul was from Belfast. <laughs> Just settle down. I'm sure many of you have either said that within your family or even in a work context. But why had Paul identified this as a significant issue? 
Well, first, their actions have an impact on everyone. And Tom Wright had an illustration which I thought was really um, useful for us. So I wonder if um, any of you have even watched a ballet or even if you watch Strictly, it's the same sort of principle, or um, if you've been to see Riverdance, even. I think it's having a bit of a revival um, at the minute. The performance just really enthralls and you watch and everybody's legs and arms and everything are just totally in line. So Wright suggests that part of the beauty of a well-performed ballet is the way in which the individual and the group work perfectly together. Every individual must dance his or her particular part exactly right in order that the whole ensemble can stay in exactly the right line without a single toe or heel out of place. It takes years of training to dance like that, of course, and hours of practice for each particular sequence, but the effect is worth the work. Or even think about our band this evening. If everybody was just playing their own thing, if they hadn't practiced beforehand, if they weren't all doing what they were supposed to be doing at the right time, we would have had a different experience at the start of the service. But the second reason is that being lazy or idle was going against the teaching that they had already received from Paul and the example that had been set by him and his companions. So have a look again at the passage in verse 7. We were not idle when we were with you. Verse 8, on the contrary, we worked night and day. Verse 9, we did this to make ourselves a model for you to follow. So Paul and the other apostles who were with him not only talked the talk, but they walked the walk. So to be idle or lazy, as some of the Thessalonians were, was to be disobedient to the very word that they had been taught and the example that they had been shown. I think it'd be good to pause just for a minute to think about what Paul is not saying here. So I don't think he's addressing people who had never heard the gospel before and in a sense didn't know any better. The people that when we think of, how will they know if they haven't heard? But these people did know because they had heard and they had seen it in action. And I don't think Paul's proclaiming a gospel of works without faith or somehow, somehow suggestion now that you know, our salvation needs to be earned. But I think he's highlighting what is consistent in many other parts of scripture, that a heart overflowing in love for the Lord can't help but be obedient to his commands. Um, if you think back to Frank's bottle of water that I had in the pulpit that Mark will remember, whatever's inside us will, will come out. But faith without works is dead, as we know it says in James's letter. So that's two things. The third thing, I don't think this passage is saying that people who aren't in paid employment or are somehow able, unable to um, serve in church or, or wasters are unworthy of support. There's many valid reasons why that might be the case, whether it's family commitments or a period of ill health or a sudden change of circumstances or the list um, goes on. There may be times and seasons of our lives where it's just not feasible to serve in practical ways around this church and again I don't think this is the position that Paul is looking at here and I think importantly I don't think this passage from Paul has given us carte blanche to tell other people that we think they're lazy and that they need to pull their socks up but what was why was this problem caused in the first place well maybe they'd become compromised by the culture around them I wonder if you can remember back to when Paul spoke to us on 1 Thessalonians 4 and the reminder of the church of the call to their holiness, avoiding sexual immorality and living in a way that was holy and honourable because they had been compromised by the world around them. We are fortunate to live in a culture that's been founded, shaped on Christian values, although we can start to feel that slip away, maybe within our peer group, maybe within our family members and our workplace, um, people maybe who don't share our values or understanding of the world and the temptation to kind of change who we are, what we think, what we say, to not hold on to the things of God is very real. So that's the first one, conforming to the culture around them. Or maybe they'd become too focused on spiritual things and they'd forgotten about the practical need. We might say that they were being too heavenly minded to be of any earthly use. I wonder, are we sometimes in danger of being pious for Jesus, but not very productive for the gospel? 
or maybe they were just coasting along for a bit. They were enjoying being part of this family or community of new believers who shared possessions, who broke bread in each other's homes, relishing in the love and grace poured out upon them through their new life in Christ. But right now, just along for the ride. And last Sunday morning, Stephen reminded us that there are many people who call Christ Lord or call Christ Saviour, but haven't yet called Christ Lord of all of their lives. But I wonder is one of the reasons, one of the misunderstandings that Paul was seeking to address um, earlier on in this letter around the second coming of Jesus. There was some of the view that, well, Jesus had returned already. So if that's what you thought, then there's no need to be at all this work because Jesus was already returned. Not so, says Paul. The problem that he has identified with the practice of some of the believers is serious and must be addressed. And why is that? Because at its heart is rebellion and sin. So what is Paul's suggested remedy? So we'll look again at verses 6, 10 and 14. Keep away from every brother who is idle. If a man shall not work, he shall not eat. Do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed. And this isn't a mere suggestion from Paul. If you look at verse 6, it's a command. It's very strong language, isn't it? We don't really like being commanded to do things. And we certainly don't like being commanded to say away from other people, especially because they might be people that we know and love. Shouldn't we be finding ways to make our table bigger, more inclusive, not shunning other believers or keeping away from them? Aren't we all just sinners, saved by grace, muddling through until the time Jesus returns or takes us home? Well, let's just think um, a little about what Paul's instruction or his command might have looked like in the context of the early church. So you remember back in Acts chapter 2, we read of the believers having everything in common. They enjoyed food and fellowship in each other's homes. It's likely that the church in Thessalonica was a similar fellowship of believers, where those who weren't pulling their weight actually became a significant burden. Being isolated from the fellowship would have been a significant wake-up call, revealing the consequences of their half-heartedness. And in verse 15, Paul says that these people should be warned as brothers, not as enemies. They're still part of the fellowship of believers, but they're commanded and urged by Paul in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread that they eat. In verse 12, stop being busybodies and settle down. I wonder, as we've read through those verses, maybe a situation has come to your mind or maybe even a person has come to your mind. But before we go to other people, I wonder, are there some questions that we need to ask ourselves? What is distracting us? What is distracting you or me from wholehearted service to the Lord? Now, this might sound quite trivial, but one of the things I have done in response to my preparation for this this evening is um, cancel some of the TV recordings on my TV box. It's only a small thing, but things that might distract me, things that I don't really need to be filling my head with. What are we busying ourselves with? Here at church or other areas of service, within our workplace, amongst our friends, in our families? Are we directing our energy and attention to places that just aren't that necessary? Are we busy? Are we busy bodies? Or have we started to tire of doing what is right, which is Paul's instruction in verse 13? I know a lot of you here are already really involved in Bloomfield and in other places in many different ways. And this isn't a guilt trip in order to make you do more. But at the start of a new term, it can be worth asking yourself, what's your purpose? Where is your focus? How are you serving this community of believers? Are you busy for the sake of it? Or are you busy doing what is right? If you're not sure of the answers to those questions, 
talk to somebody about it. Talk to your friend, talk to an elder, talk to someone on the ministry team. They'd be more than happy to work through those questions with you. What does this mean for us as a community of believers in 2022 in Bloomfield Presbyterian Church here in East Belfast? Let's um, just jump over to Hebrews chapter 12. I think it's going to come up on the screen just to see another passage which speaks of um, discipline. So Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 5. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Discipline, being open to it and receiving it, is part and parcel of the life of a believer. In fact, not only should we expect it, but it's for our good that we may share in God's holiness. Is that too bitter a pill to swallow? It's definitely a very different message than what we get from the rest of society. I found this quote online. It said, have the audacity to do what feels good. Have the audacity to do what feels good. No, says God. Have the courage to do what is good. Never tire of doing what is right. In Matthew 18, we've got a model of what resolving a situation within a community of believers might look like. Um, you remember what that says, if a brother sins against you, go and talk to him. And if he doesn't listen, take two or three other people along and try it again. There are principles here of accountability, of keeping things between a small group of people, of not gossiping, of not trying to kind of build up a body of support around you. But I wonder, do you intentionally um, place yourself in situations where you are accountable to other people? It can be easy to drift in and out of services, maybe have a cup of tea and head home. Have you ever thought about meeting someone through mutual prayer? Are spiritual conversations part and parcel of your interactions with your friends, just like Ian mentioned this evening? Instead of asking, how are you? Might you ask instead, how is your soul? I wonder, are you part of a connect group? And that's something that Pete talked about last week as well. A place to study and learn about the Bible together, to pray for one another, to receive fellowship and encouragement. A place where we can be accountable to one another. With our own, within our own denomination, we have processes and procedures around discipline. They're not easy. They're very hard for everyone involved on all sides. But they're important. Not because we want to shut people out, but because we know better. And I don't mean that in any sort of arrogant way. Only that we have the scriptures already and we have the example of those who have gone before us. We don't like being pulled up or told something there's something that we need to change. But remember again that Paul has done this in the context of his love and compassion for his fellow believers in Christ. Maybe laziness and idleness isn't our particular concern here in Bloomfield, but there are other little foxes that can spoil the vines. I wonder if someone shares a struggle with sin or a particular challenge in their lives with us, does it become the next thing that we tell our friends the next time we see them? Are we more concerned with identifying sin and feelings in other people than we are about being diligent about our own? We've been gifted with the scripture and the example and teaching of those within it. Do we just need to settle down and keep our attention on what is right? 
And as we come to the Lord's table this evening, now is the time to repent of such things, to acknowledge Jesus not only as our Saviour, but also as our Lord, to place him on the throne of our lives and remove the idols which have got in the way, to settle down and to do what is right. And if we've heeded this warning then, we'll be able to echo Paul's final prayer in this letter and our third prayer for this evening. The prayer that the Lord himself will give you peace at all times and in every way. Not that our troubles, our pain or our suffering might cease. The Thessalonian church would continue to face persecution. But that in the midst of all circumstances, we would know the peace that only Christ can bring the peace that passes all understanding. I wonder where you go to find your peace. Maybe it's in the mountains or by the sea, maybe it's just out in your garden. I think there's a lot of contemporary advice on how to find peace and often we're encouraged to find inner peace inside ourselves. As we enter another week, a new school term, a new year in a calendar of church activities, Sometimes it feels like September hits like a bit of a tsunami. There's no better time to be reminded that true and perfect peace can only be found in the Lord Jesus. Just as in our last song before the sermon, run to Jesus who is strong and kind, to the Lord who is good and faithful. Only he can give perfect peace at all times and in every way. And that invitation to perfect peace is open to you and to me today. So that's it. We've done it. We've got through First and Second Thessalonians over the summer. Maybe it has been harder or more challenging than you anticipated. We have dealt with some tricky things, but we've also seen Paul's love and compassion for his brothers and sisters in Christ. And most importantly, we've encountered the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so as we finish, Let's use those verses from the start of chapter 3 as our prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful. We pray that you will strengthen us and protect us from the evil one. Give us the desire to continue to do the things that you command. And may our hearts be directed into your love and Christ's perseverance. For it's in his names we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast with worship services at 11am and 7pm every Sunday. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.